everyone. Welcome back to Storytime at Home with Miss Beth. Before we get started, we're going to be using sticks today, or if you have wooden spoons, those work well too. So I'll give you a chance to go and grab those. All right, now we're gonna get started. So remember, let's keep a beat. Hello everybody, how do you do? How do you do? How do you do? Hello everybody, how do you do? How do you do today? Cha cha cha. All right. My first story today is called Southwest Sunrise, and it's written by Nikki Grimes. She's an award winning author, and it is illustrated by Wendell Meyer. Southwest Sunrise. Too old to cry myself to sleep, I hide behind my baseball cap, close my eyes, and pout all the way from New York to New Mexico, mad about moving to a place of shadows. That's all I see when we land. Why are we here? What's so great about New Mexico? I wake up to a knife of sunlight slicing through the room Dad says is mine. I rub my eyes, stare out the barless window at a mountain striped in a rainbow. Hey, who put that there? I didn't see it last night. I pad across the, the cool tile floor, spy a rope of chili pep, red chili peppers dangling in the kitchen window. Bet it's the only color I'll find here. Everybody knows browns and tans are the only colors deserts are good for. Even so, I take a step outside to take a look around. Gripping the field guide Mom gave me at breakfast, I flip through the pages, spot fancy named flowers and lots of bright shades I don't expect to find. Wait, there's one called Wine Cup spilling its burgundy beauty for me to drink up. And aren't those yellow bells? They wake up the desert with their silent ring. Oh... Hot red firewheel flowers. Their tips flame yellow-orange across the canyon. There's a patch of calypso orchids. So glad I didn't miss them dancing purple in the wind. My mom will love those. What do you know? Opposite our house, I discover another kind of color. A house made of pinkish clay with edges round as bubbles. Adobe. I shiver from the silence, unbroken by the familiar sound of sirens, but not for long. A few yards down the road, I pick up the mad chatter of winged gossips, passing secrets from one unfamiliar tree to another. The guidebook calls them pinyon trees. Somebody should tell these flying chatterbox magpies. Somebody should tell these flying chatterboxes magpies are beautiful when their beaks are still, or when they sail on air and ride across the sky with their long black tips of their tails. I look up, try to understand the deep waves of turquoise overhead. I search for the end of blue, but there is none. Where was all the sky in New York City? Was it hiding? Never mind the sky, I still miss the feeling of wow craning my neck to study the tops of skyscrapers. I lower my eyes to watch where I am going. A giant blackbird parades by, feathers slick as wet hair. I cluck at him like he's a simple city crow, but the guidebook says he's a raven. The kingly bird cocks his proud head and stares me down for the insult then slowly struts away, certain I can't catch him. My early morning walk kicks up another surprise, one stunned cousin of the alligator. I squat down, catch the lizard with cupped hands, feel his curved digits skitter across my palm, as ready to run as I am ready to let him. 
I shade my eyes from the desert sun and squint. The river of sand washes up bleached bones like shells, seashells at Jones Beach. Rib, bird skull, turtle shell. What stories do they have to tell? I reach the road's end, turn a corner, and I am startled by the stone towers off in the distance, red rock pillars holding up the sky. Daddy should have told me this new place had its own skyscrapers. Jaden, I hear Mom's voice cut through the quiet. Time to head back, but not before I pick a few flowers. I wave to Mom where she waits on the porch, flash her a fistful of flowers, and the first smile she's seen since New York. Maybe I can think about calling this place home. You enjoyed that story? All right, let's grab those sticks that we talked about, ready? And we're gonna sing a song with them, ready? We tap our spoons together, we tap our spoons together, we tap our spoons together, because it's fun to do. We tap them up high, we tap them down low, we tap them in the middle, because it's fun to do. All right, let's try that one one more time. Ready? We tap our spoons together. We tap our spoons together. We tap our spoons together. Because it's fun to do. We tap them up high. We tap them down low. We tap them in the middle. Because it's fun to do. All right. Let's put those six down. We're going to use them again in a little while. My next story is called Two Bicycles in Beijing. It's written by Teresa Robeson and it is illustrated by Yi Wu. Okay. And as I read the story to you, uh, some of the words are uh, Chinese translations and I might not pronounce them exactly correctly, so just bear with me on that. All right, Two Bicycles in Beijing. Two bicycles in Beijing. One, two. E, a. Side by side, Lunza and Wangche came out of the factory. One, two. E, a. Side by side, Lunza and Wangche sat in a bicycle shop in Beijing. They leaned to the left together and gazed at the world together. They watched people bustle past and traffic whiz by. They watched customers enter the shop, pick up bicycles, and leave. They wished they could stay like this forever. But one day, a girl with a sky blue sweater and a cloud white apron came into the shop. She sat on some of the bikes. She ran her fingers along their frames. Her eyes lit up when she saw Huangche. That is the perfect bike, she said, the sun to my sky. She paid for Huangche and wheeled him out the door. Oh no, thought Lunza. She tipped over. As the store clerk propped Lunza back up, a boy entered the shop. He wore a messenger bag and a cheerful smile that grew even bigger when he saw Lunza. That is the perfect bike, he said, a zesty red as I zip around the city to make deliveries. Lunza's hope rose. Hurry, hurry, she thought. I can still find Huangcha if we hurry. The boy wheeled Lunza outside and hopped on. Ring, ring, watch out. Lunza wove through the crowds in the narrow hutang. Ring, ring, ring. Lunza turned onto the main road from the alley. The wider Jia was also bustling with people. Where could Huangcha have gone? Ducks took to the sky in a panic as Lunza raced by Nanguin Park. She, zo she zoomed onto a daji, mirroring the flight of ducks. Lunza spied a flash of yellow to the right. 
Could that be Wangja? No, it was only the yellow purse of someone entering the National Art Museum. They veered left, tipping south with the curve of the road. Another flash of yellow. <gasps> Could that be Huangja? It was the yellow clothes of the performers darting and spinning in a martial arts dance outside the gates of the Forbidden City. Lunza cycled on through Beihai Park as the ducks landed in the pond. Yellow, yellow. Could that be Huangja? No. It's only the golden tail of a child's kite, twirling in the autumn air. Past the park, traffic hummed and traffic roared, yellow here and yellow there. But they were cars and jackets and store signs, millions of bicycles in Beijing, and none was Lunza's friend. Brr ring ring. They were at the Beijing concert hall now. A glint of yellow. Was that Huangcha? Still no. It was only yellow chrysanthemums outside the building, soft buttery dots in the late afternoon light. Past Tiananmen Square they flew, no yellow at all. Time to go home now, my pretty red bicycle, said the boy. All my deliveries are done. They turned westward. Lunza rolled, a little slow, a little wobbly. The day had been an adventure, but her heart ached for Huangcha. The boys stopped at a shop to buy pastries for dinner. Lunza le leaned against the brick wall with a sigh. Then, a whoosh of yellow just ahead. It was probably nothing. Ring, ring, ring. Could it be? It was! The girl with the sky blue sweater wheeled her sunny yellow bicycle out from the alley and leaned it face to face with Lunza. Lunza and Wangji grinned from handlebar to handlebar. Ni hao, said the boy. Your bike was next to was in the shop next to mine. I remember it, said the girl. Would you like a bow? the boy offered. The girl laughed a tinkling laugh like the sound of a bicycle bell. Yi, er, yi, er, one, two, one, two. Side by side, old friends and new. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that story. My next story is called the one and only Dylan St. Clair. It is written by Cayman Edwards and it is illustrated by Jeffrey Ebeler. The one and only Dylan St. Clair. Every morning when the sun comes up, the stars disappear. Well, all but one, Dylan St. Clair and today is the day he plans on shining the brightest. It's audition day for the, our school musical. This year it's all about the solar system and I just know I'm going to be a star. Literally, I'm going to play the star, a role I was born for. Dylan spent all summer perfecting his craft at Mama Rose's day camp for little superstars where he worked on jazz, tap, come on, Reba, point your paws, vocal training, let's bring it on home, Reba, mime. All his hard work had come down to this. It's time for Dylan to shuffle ball change off to school and earn his spot in outer space. Wow, that's quite an outfit. You gotta dress for the job you want, Mom. But here's the thing about seeing a star shining during the daytime. A lot of people don't know what to make of it. Are you a star? Every day, thank you for noticing. But today, I'm also dressed like one. If Mama Rose's day camp for little superstars had a class on how to make an entrance, Dylan could teach it. 
Hey, Becky. Hey, Kristen. I'm saving my voice for the audition. Can't talk. Should we tell him there aren't any auditions? Don't ruin his day. He's wearing tap shoes. It turns out Dylan may have misunderstood how this was all going to work. Okay, class. It's time for me to tell you what role you'll be playing in our musical. Our son will be Becky. Our star will be Kirsten. Whoa, whoa, aren't you forgetting something, Mrs. Lovett? I haven't even sung one note yet. Don't worry, Dylan, I'd never forget about you. You're going to be our squirrel. A squirrel? Wait, but, but how? This was a show about the solar system. There aren't any squirrels in outer space. Hey, Dylan, I'm sorry you're upset, but could I wear your sunglasses when I'm the sun? And um, can I borrow your tap shoes for when I play the star? Like any good actor, Dylan is very in touch with his emotions. At Mama Rose's day camp for little superstars, he learned a breathing exercise to use when his emotions got the best of him. <sighs> what am I going to do? The entire school year is ruined. My life is ruined. My acting career is over before it even began. You okay? Why are you crying? Because I'm a squirrel. A squirrel in space without tap shoes or sunglasses. And that's bad, right? What should have been Dylan's favorite week of the year is quickly turning into his worst nightmare. I'm the sun, a giant ball of gas that the earth revolves around. I'm super bright, so don't look directly at me. I'm a star. I twinkle, twinkle, twinkle all night, decorating the sky with my shimmering glitter. And I'm a squirrel. I don't belong here. Just when he thinks things can't get any worse... Dylan, could you try on your costume so I can see if it fits? Are you sure I can't sing a quick 16 bars instead? Am I being punished for saying that our class Halloween decorations look basic? Is this because last year I wrote my own monologue and took seven bows? Shouldn't the squirrel at least have a tap number? Apparently, Dylan isn't the only one having a hard week. I really don't want to do this. Everyone's going to be staring at me, and I can barely walk with this ring around me. Are you kidding? You have one of the best roles. I'd love to be Saturn. You know, if you skip instead of walk, your ring will bounce and spin and give the audience some real razzle-dazzle. That's easy for you to say. You love the spotlight. Plus, the squirrel is the best part of the show. Hmm. I guess there is a certain whimsical spirit to the character. The only squirrel ever to go into space. By the rings of Saturn, you're right. It's my duty as an actor and a friend to squirrels to boldly go where no squirrel has ever gone before. And just like that, Dylan begins his quest to be the best squirrel his school has ever seen. Nay, the world has ever seen. Do any of you fly? Excuse me, ma'am. What are your thoughts on space travel? Have you ever studied jazz or tap? What's your vocal range? You look like a tenor. Dylan may not have been cast as the star, but he's certainly found his own way to shine like one. Look out, universe. This squirrel is ready for blast off. And that's why I, the first squirrel astronaut in outer space, I'm absolutely nuts for the solar system. There are a million stars in the sky, and from the Earth, they all look the same. Each twinkles and shines just like the ones next to it. But not Dylan St. Clair. In a sky full of stars, he's a squirrel. Okay. Wasn't that a fun story? 
All right, let's grab those spoons or sticks again. We're gonna do another song with them. We're gonna do This Old Man. Ready? Let's get ready. This old man, he played one. He played knick-knack on my thumb with a knick-knack paddy-whack with the dog a bone. This old man came rolling home. This old man, he played two. He played knick-knack on my shoe with a knick-knack paddy-whack give the dog a bone. This old man came rolling home. This old man, he played three. He played knick-knack on my knee with a knick-knack paddy-whack give the dog a bone. This old man came rolling home. This old man, he played four. He played knick-knack on the floor with a knick-knack paddy-whack give the dog a bone. This old man came rolling home. This old man, he played five. He played knick-knack way up high with a knick-knack paddy-whack give the dog a bone. This old man came rolling home. This old man, he played six. He played knick-knack on his sticks with a knick-knack paddy-whack give the dog a bone. This old man came rolling home. Right. Let's put our sticks down. We'll get ready for our last story. This one is called Greta and the Giants, and it was inspired by Greta Thunberg's Stand to Save the World. It is written by Zoe Tucker and illustrated by Zoe Persico. Greta and the Giants. There once was a girl who lived at the heart of a beautiful forest. Her name was Greta. One morning, things weren't quite as they should be. Greta stepped out into her yard and there, huddled together in the shadow of the trees, were all the animals of the forest. A soft silvery brown wolf stepped forward with his tail low to the ground. Please help us, he whispered. The forest is broken, and we don't know where to go. The giants are ruining our home. The giants had always been there for as long as Greta could remember. But now they were worse than ever. They were huge lumbering oafs, and they were always busy. They chopped down trees to build homes. Then they chopped down more trees and built bigger homes. The houses grew into towns and the towns grew into cities. They built factories and shops and cars and planes. And they, they worked all day and all night until eventually there was hardly any forest left. But the greedy giants had forgotten how wonderful the forest was. They didn't see all the little birds and bugs and butterflies and bears that trembled in the shadows. And no one told them to stop because everyone was scared of them. Everyone except Greta. Will you help us? asked the wolf. Greta looked around her. The animals looked tired and sad. She had to help them. But how? Then Greta had an idea. The next morning, Greta went into the middle of the forest and waited for the giants to come. She stood alone, holding a big sign. The sign said, stop. She waited and waited. On the first day, the giants didn't see her and lumbered on by. And on the second and third too. But on the fourth day, something strange happened. A little boy who had been watching Greta made a sign and came and sat down next to her. He didn't say much, but Greta knew he felt like she did. Soon more people and animals saw what they were doing and joined in too. Before long, a huge crowd filled the forest, stretching out to the city and the roads beyond. They stood together and waited. The crowd was so huge. That stopped the giant, that the giants were stopped in their tracks. Please stop, Greta cried. Your greedy behavior is spoiling our home. 
You've broken the trees and trampled the flowers, and now the bees and the birds have flown away. The animals are homeless, and our forest is dying. After Greta had spoken, everything was silent. But then everyone in the crowd began to shout, The smoke from your fires is choking the air. And please stop cutting down the trees. You can help plant some new ones and mend my home. We need to take care of the forest and live together. Will you try? Will you please try? They all said. The giants shuffled and fidgeted and stomped their feet on the ground. They were a little, they were embarrassed and a little bit sad. You see, the giants were so busy building, they didn't see what they were doing to the forest or to the animals that lived there. The giants felt terrible. We're sorry, they said, and they promised to try harder. So from that day on, the greedy giants weren't so greedy. They slowed down and learned to sit quietly. They stopped working all the time and instead took up new hobbies. They stopped chopping down trees and learned all about gardening and living in the forest. They cooked, repaired, tidied, and shared, and before long, the forest became more beautiful than they could ever have imagined. Okay. I hope you enjoyed that story. Now, all these books that I just read to you today, these are all brand new books. They are available for you to take out of the library. If they're checked out, we can absolutely put them on hold for you. All right, so before we go, let's sing our goodbye song. Popcorn, peanuts, apple pie, thank you so much and goodbye. Popcorn, peanuts, apple pie, thank you so much and goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. We'll see you next time.